Imagine yourself being in a dark room with a beloved person. Imagine yourself being so lucky to be on a bed with that beloved person. And imagine then touching that person. All the rest I leave it to your imagination. Let me guide you to the second situation. Imagine you're in a romantic dinner, you are about to propose the wedding to the beloved uh, future wife, and just in a moment you are going to say these most important words of your life, you are grasping the glass of wine, and of course magic is there. So all of these things, feeling the shape of object, understanding the consistency of object, and feeling the force with which we are pressuring something, we take it for granted. Unfortunately, for millions of amputees around the world, it is impossible. They only have to rely on their vision or experience in order to understand what do they do with their hands. And this is the main reason why then they are feeling these prosthetic hands as a foraging body and why they refuse, in general, using them if they are not obliged. In ancient Greece, in today Sicily, Syracuse, uh, Archimed was playing in a bath tube, uh, and while doing so, he observed that the volume of the water that was going up and down while he was playing with the parts of his body was the same in a volume as them. And in that moment, his vigorous mind understood something, which was then known as a famous physical law. He was so happy that he jumped around uh, naked, uh, running through the streets of Syracuse and shouting, Eureka! Several centuries after it, uh, the young British physicist called Isaac Newton was in his garden and when he observed that the apple was falling in front of him. In that moment, that uh, gave him an input to found what is today known as the physical laws of dynamics and the gravitational laws. Today, the science and technology are not anymore like this. Today, we are not speaking anymore about something called the Eureka moment. Today, this is rather a process. This is rather the framework which has to be done in order to arrive to something which is scientific discovery, which can change the life of several persons in the world. So my goal today is, yes, to explain you a little bit about our uh, invention, about uh, the work in which I was a lucky part of the beautiful team. But together with that, my goal today is to teach you, to, to transmit you an, uh, my idea of about how the process of scientific discovery and technology is made today. So, which are, which are the ingredients of this process? The first and basic one that was also in Archimedes and Isaac Newton cases, the creativity and intuition. Without that, we do not go in any direction. The second one is deep physical understanding of the process of the problem that we are trying to understand and address. The third one is essential. Whenever you have a good idea and you propose something that could be an excellent solution, you need to propose the experiments in a proper way in order not to waste your time, energy, in bad and unprecise results. The fourth is the hard teamwork. Without that, today, making any success in modern science and technology is completely impossible. And finally, the last but not the least, one among the uh, mix mixturing together with all of this is never give up. So any difficulty, any challenge that you would not expect is there and you have to accept it as such and not to be there, stand and don't know how to uh, work with that. So basically, uh, present prosthetic hands are something similar to this. These are very simple on-off devices. Uh, users are able to use very, uh, th their dexterity is very much limited as you can observe here because they are unable to take very small objects in a proper way. But mainly, the most important point is that they do not feel anything from these hands. So imagine having some artifact here, like a ring, and trying to live with that ring. Of course, that's not part of your body. And this is the reason for which many persons are even using some homemade solution as a gentleman here who made his own hands, or mainly using the Aesthetic, prosthet aesthetic prosthesis, which are basically the cosmetic prosthesis unusual for the functional grasping. What is our goal? Our goal, our mission, our dream is to substitute the real hand, to give as much as possible of the functionality in terms of dexterity, because we are able to do incredible movements with the hand, but also and mainly in this project to give the sensations to the user. So the user should understand that he or she is doing that movement and feel how, when, and 
In that process, this is our strong belief, at the end, these users would be able to understand the prosthetic hand as a part of their own body. And so tomorrow, we would have the prostheses that are not anymore artifacts, that are not anymore foraging bodies, that are new parts of our old body. How to do so? So idea is very simple. It is borrowed from um, scientific uh, movies uh, from 80s. We use the residual nerves and we plug them to something which is called bionic prosthesis. Easy enough, right? But in order to arrive there, we had to do several steps. The first thing to understand is how can we interface with the uh, nervous system? So many centuries ago, uh, one beautiful Italian scientist called Golgi, was, uh, he understood uh, that by electrical stimulation, we are able to elicit the movements in normal muscles. So there is something down there. But after a lot of study, the present science understood how do we interact in a global way with the nervous system by means of electrical stimulation. That enabled us today to pr produce very precise computational models that, that were able, starting from the pictures of real nerves of rats, to propose the computational model to study how the electrical current is defunding through the nerve, and together with that, to understand which is the shape, the best shape of electrode to be used in order to stimulate selectively the nerves. In very basic words, it means how I'm able to stimulate one finger with respect to the other finger. Computational models and deep understanding of, the mo of this problem helped us to do so. As a second step, of course, we have something which is computational model and it's not reality. We had to do the proper experimental design. So we sat, we understood after hours and hours of uh, discussions, which is the way to test these findings within the rats. Then we performed long-term studies in rats. Many, many, many stimulation patterns were studied in order to understand which is the proper electrode and which is the proper way of stimulating the residual nerves. Then, of course, the moment of the creativity and intuition was always there. What you can see in these scratches are something which is very much similar to what was then done during the real implantation within the human. We were studying, we were trying to understand in which way to place these tiny electrodes within the residual nerves in a way to stimulate, to stimulate well and efficiently. And of course, difficult part of this problem, we can have many type of imagining what would happen. Is it similar to rats? Is it similar to the computational model? But at the end, all this creativity and intuition has to be transformed in a real patient study. And then this is the moment of the truth. And so in reality, this is what was pretty much happening during our real implantation. So uh, the amputee user, 10 years post-amputation, was implanted with these tiny, small electrodes, which are only 80 microns, microns which is pretty much like uh, two hairs of the human hair, that were placed transcutaneously to the residual upper limb nerves. And in that way, we were able, and you can see it here, median and ulnar nerve, these nerves are innervating the first three fingers and last three fingers and underlying palm. So these are the key nerves in order to understand the manipulation by means of the hand. And then, in a the moment that they are implanted and of course transcutaneously wired, we were able to stimulate every single tiny contact, and there were 56 of them, and ask repeatedly to the dentist, what does he feel? What does it mean? So whenever I was stimulating with active site number five, he would refer that feels a sensation within two first fingers. Whenever I was stimulating with active site number 16, he would refer the sensation of touch in a palm, etc. In that way, we were able to construct the map of his missing hand. So whenever I was switching on the active site number five, he would say, yes, I feel first two fingers. Whenever I was stimulating through the active site number 17, he would say, yes, I feel the small finger. And then, the science is there. Now is the moment for the technology. What did we do? We implemented this finding within a bidirectional prosthetic framework where the user was using his residual muscles, which were here in these holes, in order to voluntarily control the prosthesis. So whenever he would like to make this, this, or that movement, we were able to transform that to the movement of a prosthetic device. But what was key of this finding was whenever the device was moving, we were able to read out these sensors and to stimulate in a proper way the residual nerves. So basically, whenever he was trying to make the pinch grasp, he would get the stimulation through the median nerve electrodes and feel that he's doing a pinch. Whenever he was trying to do the ulnar grasp, he would feel the stimulation through the ulnar nerve and understand how much does he close the hand in ulnar way. And finally, whenever he was trying to make a power grasp, we were stimulating the both nerves, and he would feel the full hand sensation. 
And that last thing is magic, because a priori nobody would know that this would feel, because we think it's normal, but eventually it could happen that we stimulate the median nerve, and he feels only that with respect on the ulnar, but they were functioning together well. And so, more in detail, how does it work in dynamic uh, representation? He is touching the objects, we are reading out the artificial sensors from the hand, we are feeding this information to our computer program, and finally that computer program is triggering the neural stimulation of residual nerves. And the user is feeling completely naturally, effortless, in a proper way, the physiologically plausible touch. That's the, that's the goal of this project. He was not supposed to think about anything rest. He was really feeling the missing fingers. Of course, when this was done, everything, all the rest of the story was a piece of the cake for us. So we enabled him to do several different tasks. In this task, he's exploring the space in front of him. He understands what does he has in hand. He announces it. This is a, a type of Italian beer. And then he would do the appropriate grasp. In a case of a cylindric object, he would take it to his mouth. In a case of the median object, he would understand that he has something within the first two fingers, and he would announce it. And the same for the ulnar object. Little finger. During all experiments, he was blindfolded and acoustically insulated. In that way, we were sure that he is not relying on his sight, on his gaze, in order to understand what is he doing. And also, we were sure that he is not listening to the prosthetic movement because all the motors, you can hear them. So he could eventually imagine, oh, the motors are working in this way, I'm closing so much my hand. We were completely assured that what he was doing is completely relating to his neural stimulation. On the other side, we were able even to do more. Since he was so able to understand the different shape, the different force levels, we proposed him to try to understand even the stiffness of the object. So he was proposed as here, with a hard wooden object, and he was saying hard. And his goal was to understand which type of object is that, hard, medium, or soft. Medium. That was a medium plastic object. Soft. And finally, that would be a soft object. For us, it seems trivial. For us, it seems granted. But believe me, especially in the case of double amputation, so in bilateral amputation, uh, these persons are unable to explore the world around them. So imagine not having any of the hands and trying to understand which object you have in the front. You didn't imagine, of course, because fortunately you don't have this type of situation. But this is the reality. And we believe that in this way we would enable them to regain the normal quality of the life. So very important thing is, of course, uh, is this hand, by the time, becoming more and more a part of his body, a natural part of his body, as we were believing that it would happen? And so listen, what did he say about that? I would say also what is amazing with this is I don't have to look all the time what I'm doing, with my, because here I can feel what I'm doing. So that's, of course, the biggest difference. And um, when, if you have this for, let's say, a year or something, then you will... Uh, adapt and trust in it so so you can yeah do things in the dark which have uh, I have been doing here but then uh, it will be a, a piece of me I'm sure the keyword it would be a piece of me and remember for the example of the darkness in the starting of this story he said that he said that he would be feeling confident in doing the stuff in the darkness and of course not everything what was done was so beautiful and perfect during experiments, we had many problems, but solving these unexpected problems was essential in order to achieve such a result. And the main goal was to make from them the challenge and not an obstacle. So we were continuously repairing whatever was not going well. And on the other side, there is one point that I didn't stress, which was the hard teamwork. In this type of studies, this is a key element. We are all together, engineers, medical doctors, physicists, mathematicians, working in a way to enable this device to become something that will change the world world and uh, the life of these persons. And so these are kind of the pictures you could see after our work, and beautiful pictures, very appealing. But what was in reality happening was something much more similar to this situation. 
So you can have a TV crew, you have the experimental part, and then on the back of this computer you can see the guy on the right who was working for one month with a broken clavicula, or two guys on the left who were driving during the whole night in order to repair our power electronics when we had the system breakdown. So all that together, our dedicated work, our hours without sleeping, and our belief one with it, together with other were, were the ingredients which were essential, and without these we would never achieve nothing similar to this. And about that, there is also the part of the cooperation, which is the cooperation with the, with the real user. And so we can listen, what did he say about that? Oh, yeah, it's great guys and girls. And um, I think uh, they have been very kind and nice to me, and I really enjoyed uh, working with them. And uh, I also learned a couple of Italian words as well. So maybe I'll be, uh, I will sure be back and say hello to them now and then. Finally, there is a secret ingredient, which is the fun. Together with appropriating the, his own hand, he appropriated many Italian beers. We had a beautiful time with this beautiful guy. And without this fun and tight cooperation between all of us, between the guy who broke in the clavicula, me, I didn't sleep for months, nothing of this would happen. And, and what to do, if not only to say thanks to this beautiful group of the persons, starting from Professor Rossini, Professor Michel, and all the beautiful guys that were collaborating with me. I was a piece of a masterpiece. And Without that, nothing today in science and technology is possible. And of course, the biggest thanks go to this beautiful guy who you can see on the left, who dedicated voluntary two months of his life to change the future of amputees. Thank you very much.